All right, good morning. Well, this morning we are continuing on with our uh, series through Romans, and we are up to Romans chapter 15. So there's only 16, so there's only one, one more to go, okay? So we're getting there. And I'm just going to go through some of these, maybe one or two verses at a time, and just kind of make some comments on those and how they relate to different things. And so as we start in 15, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, normally when we think of someone being strong, we, just, we think of them as being maybe more disciplined, Maybe they have uh, more do's and don'ts, and they live a more stricter life. But actually, in this case, he's saying, no, it's those who are strong in faith. Because this all goes along with the whole chapter of 14. 14 and 50 are basically dealing with the same issues, okay? So there are no chapter divisions when it was written. It's just a letter going through. So Paul is continuing on with this same thought. Uh, so to look at some examples, just quickly through back to chapter 14, I want to just read a couple verses as we go through. But 14 verse 1 says, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Now the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat anything must not be condemned the man who does, for God has accepted him. So we see this thing dealing especially with diet in this case. This had to do with the, mainly with the Jewish law. And he was saying, hey, if you're strong in faith, everything is clean. But if you're not, you should not look down on the brothers who, in their belief system, believe, hey, I only eat vegetables or I don't eat pork or whatever it might be. And like Verse 5, drop down to that, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. So in other words, some people will believe that you need to worship on the Sabbath, on Saturday, okay? Others say Sunday. For others, and personally for me, every day is alike. You know, every day is the Lord's day. Regardless of what I'm doing, I, yeah, I'm not in here, you know, worshiping with the rest of you, but we're still, it's still the Lord's day for me. Verse 14, drop down to that. As one who is in the Lord, Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. Verse 17, which is one of my, this is one of my favorite verses. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then verse 20 says, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that will cause your brother to stumble. And in verse 22, So whatever you believe about these things, Keep them between yourself and God. So the secret becomes, that's between you and God. That's your own personal conviction. Don't try to put your own conviction 
on someone else if it's not one of the majors. So what he's saying all through 14 is basically keep the main thing the main thing. So the main thing is Jesus, right? To keep the focus on that. There's a saying that says unity in essentials, diversity in non-essential. So think about it. unity in essentials. What's the essentials? Jesus, Son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was crucified, rose from the dead, and is coming back. Those are the, the essentials of the gospel. But we can have diversity in the non-essentials. Your particular take on eschatology, when the rapture might be. Some of you are waiting for a rapture that might happen any minute. I'm not. I'm waiting for this. I believe it's coming the same time Jesus is coming. That's where we meet him in the air. But we can have differences on things like that. We talked a lot as we went through Romans about uh, Calvinism and Arminism. Okay? You can have different opinions on that. It's something that you need to search out, find out what you believe yourself. But it doesn't need to divide us. Because we all should have love in all those matters. Okay? So there's unity in the essentials, but diversity in non-essentials. And obviously in our church we have diversity. Different beliefs, but as long as we are around and believe in the core doctrines, that's what's important. Okay, verse 2 and 3. It says, each of you should please his neighbor for his own good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who have fallen on me, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance and the, and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So Christ is an example. He was the strongest and obviously the most powerful, and yet he did not please himself. He was a servant of all. And then everything that was written for us in the past was written to teach us that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. So there's going to be times when we need encouragement. There's going to be times when we need endurance. So those are things you can actually ask the Lord for. Because everything doesn't life go along smooth. I mean, sometimes the money's good. Sometimes the money's bad. Sometimes your relationship's good. Sometimes the relationships are not good. There, there are ups and downs. There's mountaintop experiences and there are valleys. But through all of them, we keep our eyes upon Jesus and the hope. And, you know, you think about uh, the hope. What, what's the, what would be the biblical uh, definition of hope? It would be a confident expectation of a glorious future. Let me say that again. A confident expectation of a glorious future. So no matter what's going on in your life right now, whether life is easy and good, life is hard, we have that confident expectation because we know where we're going. We know how the, the book ends. We know that we have a future with the Lord and that every wrong will be made right, that every tear will be wiped away, that we will be in a glorious future. So yes, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So again, we are going to go through stuff. Everything's not going to be just smooth. We're going to have ups, we're going to have downs, but we remain faithful. 
In fact, I want to read a verse out of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. It says, be nice if they made the little verses, numbers a little bigger. <clears throat> it says that faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. So that faith and love spring up from hope. You know, we think about faith, hope. And love. But it's with hope that springs up for those other things to happen. I was reading a book. In fact, I'm reading a book right now. It's called um, A Man's Search for Meaning. And it's by Victor Frank, Franklin. Did somebody say that right? Michael? Franklin. Oh, Franklin. Yes, okay. So, anyway, so he was a, um, a Jewish psychiatrist, and he was, um, of course, imprisoned in the concentration camp at Auschwitz and different camps, actually. And so he made a couple of different observations that I thought were, were really interesting regarding hope. Because he said, he who has a why... To live, he who has a why to live for can bear almost anything. Okay, if you, if you have a why, I would almost put in there, he who has a hope to live for can bear almost anything. And he said that those who lost all hope for the future were inevitably the first to die. Because they, they had no hope. And so they were the first ones to die in the concentration camps. And I think of that scripture, you know, without, without a vision, people perish. And so that's why we always have to keep our eyes on the long game, on our eternity. That this life is a, a short time. And again, whether things are going well or things are not going well, we have an incredible hope for the future. So hope is, is incredibly important that we dare, never lose that hope because we have that eternity. We have those promises from God. Okay, verses 5 and 6 we'll look at. He says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement Give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, there's that endurance and encouragement. There's sometimes we need to even pray for that. But his whole theme is give you a spirit of unity among yourselves. So the, despite the different views of, of some of the non-essential things, we can still gather together, worshiping the Lord and loving each other, despite those differences. Verse 7, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God, so we are to accept one another, again, with those different views. And sometimes it's just a matter of different emphasis. You may think that this particular doctrine is the most important. You know, Lottie was talking about, you know, abortion. That's a huge issue, an important issue. But for some people, that may be the only thing that they see and the only thing that's important to them. And so you may have other ideas as far as what you think evangelism is the most important thing or whatever it might be, but we have to 
see each other and appreciate the different gifts. It's, it's that body, you know, that picture we have the body of the different parts of the body, each functioning, taking their, their place in the body of Christ and honoring one another, even though we have different emphasis, okay? So we are in verse 8. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. And then he begins to quote different verses from the Old Testament. He says, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you people. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up one who will arise to rule over the nations, and the Gentiles will hope in him. So he's using Old Testament scriptures because He's dealing with different situations with, with, the, with the Jewish population because it's hard for them to realize that, hey, this is not just us. This is not just for us, the Israelites or the Jewish people. No, this is to go to the nations, for the Gentiles. And so he comes back and he uses the Old Testament scriptures to prove, hey, this was, a, this was God's plans from the very beginning. That this thing isn't just about Israel, it's about the world. And it's about all people, all nations. Okay, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may be so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's the God of hope. He is the one who gives us hope. And his promises is what give us that eternal hope. All right, verse 14 through 16. It says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourself are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. I have written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace God has given me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with a priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So again, Paul's purpose was to remind them of the truth of the gospel, again, going back to the Old Testament, and showing, hey, this was from the very beginning. This was the plan. This was the purpose. And, you know, we have other examples like Peter at the end of his life, he's writing his epistle, and he says, I'm doing this so that when I'm gone, you will remember. So they're constantly, the different apostles are constantly writing in remembrance so that after I'm gone, you will remember these things. And again, as far as, uh, let me go back to Ephesians I want to look at Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 11 through 16. Paul, as he's writing to the Ephesians, says, Therefore, remember 
that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that one time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one. And he's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and its regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in, his, and in his one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So God's purpose was to create one new man between Jew and Gentile, all under Christ, by the blood of Christ. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. There's no other way. And like I say, Peter and different ones of the apostles would, would also do that, where they'd write their letters and, again, reemphasize the truth of the gospel because they didn't necessarily have the New Testament in their hands. So it's a constant reminder. Okay, verse 17 and 18. Paul says, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. And I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. So his main, you know, his main ministry was to the Gentiles, but yet almost every time he goes into a city, he would go to the synagogue first. And usually after he was thrown out of the synagogue and persecuted, then he would go to the, to the Gentiles. Because it says the gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentiles. But, again, just that verse, I think most of you probably already know this, but Galatians chapter 3, just look at it real quickly. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 and 29. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male, nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So there is there one in church and also you could call it spiritual Israel because sometimes he uses that, that term that we've been grafted in, and that later some of the Jews who've been broken off will later be grafted in to that tree or to that root. Okay, 19. And he also, by the way, mentions that I will not boast that only by God's power was I able to do this. And it says, by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the, around, all the way around to Illyrium, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. 
So by the power of signs and wonders. Now we think of, of, the, of how the gospel goes forth. And it, it's interesting that as you go, you know, it's like uh, in Mark, Mark chapter 16. You know, let me read that real quickly. Mark chapter 16. What it talks about, and it says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Now, when he's talking about picking up snake, it doesn't mean you go around and you're playing with snakes. It's like when Paul was sheep, shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Remember, they were picking up sticks, and a viper cleaned them, you know, grabbed his arm, biting his arm, and he shakes it off, puts it you know, into the fire, and the people were waiting around for him to start swelling up and die. And then after he did, and they thought, he must be a god. So he went from being a murderer to all of a sudden almost being like a god. But that is the, is the meaning of that. You know, it's not something we tempt God. It's something that when that happened, the Lord protected. And we all have that promise because it's whoever will. But I think a lot of times we have to remember as we go, it's more important even than what we do in here as when we're out there. It's like over those doors we should have, you're entering your mission field as you go out because that's where the mission field is. And those signs and wonders will accompany you as you begin to get bold and begin to witness to people. So that was 19a. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit, so from Jerusalem all the way to Illyrium, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Now I might mention a little something on that too because if you think about it, when Paul went on his missionary journey, like he went to Ephesus was one of the, the place where he was at the most. He was there for three years. And it says that he witnessed to all of Asia. Well, they wouldn't, he didn't necessarily go to every village or every small town, but Ephesus was the center of the culture. It was, a, it was like our New York City, you might say. So as he witnessed there, people were coming and going. And because of people who got touched, they took it back to their, their hometown. And so in, a, in that way, all of Asia was witnessed to, and the gospel went forth. And he says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation, rather as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. So Paul was always going to places that had not yet received the Word of God. He wasn't going to some place where it was already an established church. He was going to establish churches. He was going to witness. He was going to start them as part of an apostle, the sent one, the one who starts a work. And then he appoints elders and he appoints pastors. And he goes on to the next place. But he was always constantly going to the unsaved, those who had not heard the gospel. Verse 23, but now there is no more place for me to work in these regions. In other words, I've, I've been everywhere, I've done it. I plan to, to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there. 
and after I enjoyed your company for a while. So, why was it important for Paul to go to Spain? And we don't know, we can't actually prove that whether he went to Spain or not. Church tradition says he did. But I think he also did. And the reason Spain was important was because back in Genesis, when you had the original 70 nations, the furthest nation west, because that was the furthest of the known world, was Spain. And so he saw it as his course in life to take that gospel so that all those 70 nations, and actually there's a lot more 70 nations beyond, but at that time, in Genesis, that's all they knew, to accomplish that, to accomplish his course. And, I, and you think at the end of his life where he said, you know, I fought the good fight, I have, I have kept the faith, I have finished my course. So my course is to touch all these nations and get to Spain. And that's the last one. And again, I can't prove it, but again, church tradition says he did make it to Spain. Okay, verse 25. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessing, they owe it to the Jews to share with them the material blessings. So, he's taken an offering. He went throughout, you know, uh, Galatia, and he went through what was called at that time Asia, which is now Turkey, and then he went over to Greece. And he's taken these offerings, and he usually writes ahead and tells them, I'm coming, set aside finances so that when I get there, we can receive it, and we can take it as a blessing back to Jerusalem. So the question becomes, okay, what has happened in Jerusalem? And the only thing we know for sure is that Agabus had prophesied there'd be a drought and a famine, okay? So that's probably the main reason, but there are also some scholars who think about, okay, remember when Acts chapter 1, when the Spirit falls, or in chapter 2, and the early church, they had, it says, all things in common, So the ones who had land were selling their land and bringing it to the apostles, laying it at their feet to use to help minister to the poor who were among them. Well, eventually, you run out of land to sell. And so that could also be part of the issue that was going on because while the church was birthed in that method, you know, kind of almost a communal type existence because it was just starting, but it was not meant to stay that way. It was meant to go and people in their own lives supporting themselves. But initially, as it started out, when they just had the 3,000 come converts, it was a little different. And so to start the church, it was more of a communal, people selling, sharing, but that over time began to stop. So whatever the reason was, and where there's a drought and a famine, he was taking an offering back to bless them. And he says, hey, if we share in the blessing, the spiritual blessings of the Jews, then we ought to bless them with material things. Okay, verse 28. And it says, so after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. 
I urge you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. The God of peace be with you. Amen. So Paul needed their prayers. He's asking them. He thought, obviously, that prayer was important, that prayer makes a difference. So he's asking them to pray as he's getting ready to go to Jerusalem, that he would be rescued from, from ungodly men. And that hopefully after he visits Rome or visits Jerusalem, he'd be able to go to Rome on his way to Spain. So what happened? So if, if you go to the, you know, the book of Acts, you remember he's making these collections and he's on his way back, going towards Jerusalem. And in every town, the Holy Spirit through different prophecies, through different people in the different towns, don't go. They're going to arrest you. They're going to put you in prison. You may lose your life. And each time he goes, and he goes to Ephesus, he meets them on the the beach, and, and, uh, and they're telling him the same thing. You know, the Spirit is saying, if you go, you're going to be arrested. And he says... I'm not only willing to go to be arrested and put in prison, but to die if necessary. And so finally they say, okay, let the Lord's will be done. And he also tells, like the the elders at Ephesus, he says, I know I won't see your face anymore. This is the last time. So he knew something was coming. And so he goes to Jerusalem and, you know, there's still this kind of tension going on there between the, the, the Jews and, and the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And, and so, you know, they tell, the apostles tell Paul, why don't you take a vow, shave your head, pay uh, the price for, for the vow for these other guys to go, and that will prove to them that you are not trying to tell the Jews that they need to... Uh, quit their lifestyle, basically, okay? And so he agrees to that. He does it. He goes into the temple, and then he's falsely accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple, and as a result of that, it starts a riot, and they come and they arrest him. But he did get a, he did go back to Rome on an all-expense-paid trip as a prisoner, of course, you know? So he did make it back. It may not have been the way he was thinking or planning on. And so, you know, it's how he is arrested, and then they the, uh, the caused such a riot that the, uh, the Roman cent, uh, centurion there sees something going on, and he rushes down, rescues basically Paul, because they're trying to kill him, tearing him apart, and brings him back, and... and uh, so it saves his life in that sense. But first he asks, he, he asks the Roman centurion, he says, hey, can I speak to the crowd? And he's speaking to the centurion in Greek. And he says, oh, huh, you know Greek? He says, yeah. And, and so he speaks to the crowd in Hebrew, and he goes just fine and telling them the, kind of the history again until he gets to the point where he says, basically the gospel is going to the Gentiles. And then all of a sudden they just go wild again throwing stuff, trying to kill him. So he brings him back in, and they're going to get ready to tie him to the, you know, going to flog him to find out, get the truth out of him. And then he says, hey, is it lawful for you to flog a a Roman citizen when he hasn't been acute, you know, he hasn't been tried? You're a Roman citizen? Yes. So anyway, long story short, 
He's, you know, they get him. he's not flogged. He's been flogged a lot of times, though. He's, flogged. he's got scars about scars about scars. And he's been stoned to death. They thought he was dead. So he's had a, a rough time. And he's still going to have a rough time because he's about to be shipwrecked in the future, too. But anyway, so, so he goes, and then uh, they send him. There's a plot to kill him. The Jews made, this 40 men made a, 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 a pact, said, we will not eat or drink until we kill him. And so the chief priest was to ask the centurion to bring him back so they could ask some more questions, which is really just going to be an ambush. And he is, uh, so his nephew finds out about it, tells the centurion, and then they ship him off at night to, to Caesarea so he won't be killed. So he's in prison there for two years. So he's witnessing the people as they're there, but he's still there two years before they get to really have a trial. And then after that trial, they, they want to send him back to Jerusalem to stand trial. And he knows what's going to happen if they do that. They're going to kill him on the way. And so he appeals to Caesar. And that's advantage of being a Roman citizen. Kind of like, I'll go to the Supreme Court and go to Caesar. So, okay, Caesar, you will go. So... Of course, that's when he is placed on a ship to go back to Rome. You probably know the story. He's shipwrecked. There's like 14 days where they don't see the sun, and it's a terrible storm. And, and he warned them first. He said, I, I, I perceive that this voyage is gonna, it's not going to turn out well. We're going to lose the ship and loss of life and all the cargo. But they thought better, and they took off, and the storm happened. And for 14 days, they were not, uh, didn't see the sun. It was just, you know, tossed around by the, by the sea. And then he says, an angel of the Lord stood by him one night and said, I'm going, I'm going to save everyone aboard. It's going to be lost of the ship. It's going to be lost of all the, the cargo. But not one life shall be, take, you know, shall be lost. So he breaks bread and... They haven't eaten for 14 days. And he eats and says, hey, you're going to have to have strength because we're going to crash on some rocks. So you're going to need to have some strength to be able to get to shore. And so they take heart. They eat. Long story short, they're wrecked on what was the shore of Malta, which they didn't know at the time. And then he is, uh, they all swim ashore. Of course, some of the Roman soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners because if you let a prisoner escape, you pay for it with your own life. But the centurion said, no, don't kill him because he wanted to save Paul. And then a lot of things happen when they're on Malta. He gets there, and then, like I say, the viper gets on him when they're making a fire. And, and then he heals a bunch of people. And, 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 uh, and then eventually they're let go, and he's on his way and makes it to Rome as a prisoner. So he did make it to Rome. It's just a little few curves in the road. It wasn't necessarily a straight path. So, so sometimes in your walk with the Lord, you have to remember that. A lot of times it's not a straight path. There's a lot of curves. Sometimes there's some disappointment. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. But God is faithful. And we have that eternal hope of a future. Again, regardless of what's happening now, we see the darkness closing in. We see wars, rumors of war. We see what's happening with, the, with abortion issues and the darkness is getting darker. But we have that eternal hope that we win and we have eternity to spend with the Lord. And this life, whether it's 80 years, 90 years, whatever, how long you may live, it's a drop in the bucket. So we need always to have our eyes on that hope that does not disappoint, that future hope that we have in him. And as we give our lives to him, he will impart to us that peace, that joy, Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what we are to walk in. 
And that's why the scriptures are here, because it gives us that eternal viewpoint. If we stay with the Lord, stay close to him. And even in those troubling times, he will be there to comfort. He is a God of all comfort. He comforts us even in our losses, even in, in those dark times. He is, he is there with us. He walks with us. And he wants to talk with us, as the song says. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, that it is so deep, it is so rich. And, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us that eternal hope, Lord. That we have that confident expectation of a glorious future. Lord, help us never to lose sight of that. Help us, O Lord, to keep the main thing the main thing. Not to get sidetracked with non-essential issues, but to be focused upon you. And that we don't have to be the ones to correct somebody else, that you're able to do that. So, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, Lord, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And that love never fails. And God is love. And Lord, we want to just bask in your love. We want to bask in that confidence in you. We want to live in peace. We want to live in righteousness. We want to live in joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, help us, Lord. And help us, Lord, as we leave this place, as we go out into the world in our individual spheres of influence. Lord, that you would anoint us, that you would equip us. And, Lord, that we realize the signs and wonders follow the preaching, the witnessing to your name. And for us to expect those things to happen at Walmart, at the gas station, wherever it is that we are going, Lord, that you are there. Give us a boldness, Lord, to witness. Lord, that is, that's such incredible power in, the, in our own testimonies of what God has done for us. So, Lord, give us that ability, that opportunity to share each of us our, our testimony of your faithfulness and of your goodness, Lord. And, Lord, we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Anybody would like prayer? If you have uh, never have made Lord Jesus your Lord and Savior, you need to do it today because no one's promised tomorrow. If you need prayer for healing, finance, whatever the issue may be going on in your life, prayer matters. Paul thought it was important to have others praying for him. And I think each of us need others praying for us. So be bold. Feel free to come up and receive prayer prayer. There'll be some of us up here ready to, to pray for you. And for the rest of you, bless your day. And remember, as you go, you are the witnesses. You are to be light in the midst of darkness.